I know that you're a fan of of genre and and a fan of the zombie kind of subgenre too. And I'm wondering what are the elements of this particular material that that drew you and kind of were elevated elevated in that subgenre. Well, certainly with with underlying material like Robert Kirkman's series of graphic novels, um, you have you have the perfect ingredients. You have a a powerful um, cast of characters from the comic book mm-hmm. um, who are complex and at times morally ambiguous. Uh, and you have a you have a journey that they take, um, which is perfect for a for a television series. Um, and um you know and even before the series won the Eisner this year mm-hmm. you know it was, it was clear that it was one of the top continuing series in in the comic book genre well there's also with with the horror genre um there it has a unique element to it in that it can it can speak to where we are in the world and kind of uh, social commentary in a way it, it, it offers as a genre a lot of times in the best work. Yeah, absolutely, it, it, and, and it has, I think, from the very beginning. Yeah. What, what, what about commenting the commenting on, on communism and, you know, and, you know, yeah. sort of fear, um, or I think in this case, the unsettled feeling like an apocalypse is right mm-hmm. around the corner. You know, whether mm-hmm. it's the global financial apocalypse or the apocalypses we've seen on television from natural disasters yeah. somehow all of us are living with that kind of fear and, yeah. and this is this is a way to you know to um this is a way to experience that kind of earth shattering you know demise of society through right. the characters who survive and there's something that that uh, a quote from Mr. Kirkman that I, I read in the uh, materials that I'm paraphrasing. So when you're when you're this close to death, you finally start uh, living. living. Yeah. You start appreciating yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And you know, when when every breath may be your last, mm-hmm. that's when you realize how much you love. In the case of of you know. Of Rick Lawrence, how you know how much you love your family, how you want to make your relationships work, how how much you love your your you know your family, um, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and at the same time, it also drives people to do things they wouldn't normally do because we don't have the rules of society any longer. I mean, it, you know, even though you know Rick is from law enforcement, um, you know, if you if you've seen the the press kit. You know, as he says, all I am anymore is a man looking for his wife and son. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you know, the, the, those rules don't apply. There's no one to enforce them. Well, as you said, you have a great uh, comic book series, uh, graphic novel to work from, from Robert Kirkman. Uh, was, was this the Bible kind of for the production? Is that a template that you use for story and visuals and Yes, I mean, I, I think if, you know if, you, if you've seen the material, some of the iconic panels mm-hmm. um, we brought to life, um, and at the same time, I think it's important to look at it as wonderful source material, but allowing us to branch off and delve into, you know, characters even more deeply and situations, um, um, you know, even more powerfully, and um, you know, and, all, and, and to be able to venture off that path. Yeah. At times, with 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 new characters, um, but then always coming back to the to the touchstone of of um, of Kirkman's you know great graphic novels. Yeah, um, well, he he was close to the production, wasn't oh, he? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he was he is indeed you know an executive producer along with with Frank and me, and he was on set. Um, he wrote the fourth episode. He was involved in all of the casting decisions. He's been involved in post production, um, and uh, you know, and and, and uh, you know, as as Frank is the first to say, um, you know, we all want to make sure that he's happy because he yeah. is the creator of this universe. And and Mr. Darabont, uh, obviously, he's one of our our great filmmakers. Um, and I, I remember seeing him w- when he was doing the mist. You know, he was 
he was renowned for Shawshank and, and, and Green yes. Mile. And, yes, his Stephen and the, King. His Stephen King. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, and the myth seemed to be a different animal entirely, and he seemed so giddy to be making kind of his monster movie. So, so I, I, would, I could tell why his vision and his sensibilities were perfect for this material. Uh, how, how do you think uh, they fit in with well, the Well, actually, you know, Frank, Frank is, a, is, a, is a genre geek like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and he loves genre films. Um, he's an aficionado from way back, and uh, you know, and the zombie subgenre is is one that you know that that I think he he likes and um, wanted to explore more than any other. Mm-hmm. And with with The Walking Dead, we have the perfect we have the perfect um, template. And I was pleasantly surprised that the material did not have to be softened at all no for for television uh was were there conversations that took place before you went into production to make sure that you were all on the same page in terms of that absolutely we we had a we had a um creative meeting uh all of the terrific AMC executives flew down to Atlanta before we started shooting and we 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 talked about what we could and couldn't do and um they showed us they showed us um films that they broadcast during Fear Fest. Mm-hmm. Um many of them screened completely uncut, um, unedited for television, and we realized there was nothing that we intended to put on screen um that would be in any way softened by um by their standards and practices and we were we were Happily surprised. Yeah. And in fact, um, we you know we've we've already submitted five of the six episodes, and we have not received one note from standards and practices saying, you know, this is too this is this is too extreme for for broadcast. Wow, it, it is brave television. It, it, it's a new frontier in television, isn't it? It it is, but you know, but I think I think that um, AMC is known for that. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of working in television, I mean, you've had such a highly successful career producing features. I'm wondering if if working in television is a different beast altogether, or at the end of the day, are you still dealing with the same set of challenges? Well, the wonderful thing about television is that once once the network says go, you are you are in the thick of it, and uh, and it's and it's um, relentless in terms of the pace, the fact that you roll week to week into you know new episodes, um, and there is no opportunity at all to go over mm. because of the knock-on effect. You know every episode had to be had to be finished on schedule, regardless of of you know what we we're up against. So that that's both frightening and exhilarating at the same time. Um, and we, we, you know, even though the the budgets were certainly smaller than we've dealt with in in features, we always felt as if we were able to get everything that we wanted on screen. Yeah. Um, and that there were there were no compromises. It's almost like it, it, the time that you're, you're allotted to create an entire season is the time that you'd be allotted to film a, a one feature. Exactly, and it features you know the maximum two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. You know, and we have we have you know probably six hours of of television, and it's the same when, amount of time. What does that pace do for the creative process? Do you feel it's beneficial in any way? You know, it it is. Um, you know, you you. It, it can be, it, it can be, as I said, I mean before, it, it can be incredibly intimidating, mm-hmm. um, because there is no margin for error. But at the same time, you know, necessity is often the mother of invention. Right. And when you when you don't have the latitude to go over or turn in a draft late, or you know get an extra day of prep or an extra day of shooting, you make it work. And and. It means that you have to have the best team put together, and and we we do with with the the cast in front of the camera and the crew behind the camera. They were up for the challenge. Mm-hmm. And there's also the element of the the notion of 
creating kind of a family with your with your team. And I know that films are strange because you spend three months in the thick of it with this team of creative people, and you get close, and then it's goodbye, and you you don't see many of them for a while. Yeah, but that's what series, another that's an, a, another great thing about television is the family is in it for the long haul, mm-hmm. and we felt it was very important to make sure that, that everyone was pulling in the same direction mm-hmm. um, and that um, and that truly everyone is looking forward to, you know, fingers crossed, coming back for a second season. Um, oh, I, you know, I, think, I think you're in there. I, I cannot imagine that this thing will not be a, a huge success. Well, that's, you know, that's as, my as, 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 as an expression I picked up in the South, God willing and the creek don't rise. That's right, um, that's right. It's it's uh, you know it's something that we would be thrilled and honored to be able to tackle with a, a 13 episode season, so we yeah. can really get into into the the, the characters and you know, and introduce a few more next season. I'm curious because you've been uh, in the business for you know going on 30 years producing features, uh, and how has that? What are the most profound ways that the business of making movies has changed, and how has it changed what you do? Well, it's, over the course of my career, the number of studios has um, diminished. The number of films that the studios that are, you know, um, the number of films made by each studio um, is also more limited. You know, and, and and I think that studios are unwilling to take many chances anymore. Um, I I wonder if um, you know the Terminator would be would be made now um, yeah. because it didn't come from pre-existing material. It was an original screenplay by at that time an unknown writer director. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, it, it that's what concerns me is that is that there's there are fewer opportunities now in the future film world. On the other hand, there are more opportunities on television. Yeah. There were far fewer networks in the past, um, and now it, it, you know there are not only more networks, but more risks being taken in television than in features. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, the television medium—they're the—they're the medium that's that are taking the risks now. And they're getting all the great talent as a result. Exactly. I mean, you know, who would have predicted, you know, ten years ago that you know, Martin Scorsese would have a yeah. would have a, a, a series on television, you know, or that the the writer director of the Shawshank Redemption would be, you know, would be chomping at the bit to you know to, to jump into another thirteen episodes. Absolutely. Um, you know, and and and. You know, you have you have series, you know, period pieces like like Boardwalk Empire and like Mad Men, and then you have you know, and then you have the, you know, the world of speculative fiction like Lost, mm-hmm. um, you know, and now you have comic comic book based series. It really is. It really feels as if the sky's the limit. Yeah, I'm wondering if you will be because I, I know that you've lived with it and seen it many times, but. Will you be uh, watching the premiere on Halloween night just like the rest Are of America? Are you kidding? Of course I will. <laughs> I cannot wait. I yeah. honestly cannot wait. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to the screening when we're we're able to see it in a in a movie theater, which is fun and exciting. But I'm mm-hmm. I'm also excited to see it in you know in the in the medium in in which you know um, we made it, which is um, you know for people to watch at home, hopefully with their friends and family. You know, and, and the and the horror genre really has a, a very loyal and protective fan base. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to know what kind of uh, interactions you've had with that fan base concerning this project. Well, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to, to launch um, the, the first footage um, at Comic Con in San Diego is mm-hmm. it really is the perfect marriage between a comic book um and another medium, television in this case. Um and it was important for us to to reach out to the fans and say, Listen, you know, we know this is important to you. 
you know, you've been there since the beginning, since 2003 with the, when the series launched. Um, you've been um, loyal and faithful to this, and we take it seriously, too. We want to do the best possible job in adapting it, you know, and let us know what you think. And as you know, you know, genre fans are not shy. <laughs> they will let you know what they think. Yeah. Um, no holds barred. And um, and it's also why we, we you know, the, the, the second round of footage um, um, that uh, that went public, um, we, we screened yesterday at uh, at New York Comic Con. Mm. Mm. Uh, before I let you go, I have to ask you about one particular future project uh, that's that's been talked about. We are huge uh, De Palma aficionados on mm-hmm. the show. We've done like five or six shows on on his films, and so I, I know he's gone off to do Toyer. But w- what's the status with the Boston Stranglers project? Um, well, the the company that was going to make it um, was purchased by another company, Overture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now we have to sort all of the the rights issues out um, before we can before we can move forward. Yeah, it's a real it's a real taxing long process to get some of these projects off the ground, isn't it? It it is, but you know you never you never say die. 